Hi, everybody. Um, most of you know me. I'm uh, Orla Staunton. Um, my husband refers to me as his long-suffering wife, so I'm going to take that title as uh, Karen Staunton's long-suffering wife as well. I'm um, co-founder of Ensepsis, and also I um, am the executive director of the foundation. Um, just just to the day that's in it, it's World Sepsis Day, and I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the human cost of sepsis um, that I have experienced and that many people here have experienced, including Anne Cheskine, who's traveled here from Arizona, whose beautiful young daughter died three, three months after getting married, Katie. Um, there are sepsis survivors here. Um, as a group of people, we talk differently than, than you know, I've heard, I've heard here this morning. We cry a lot with each other. Um, we, we talk about how we weren't listened to. We talk about how our loved ones were not treated properly. We talk about how we never knew about sepsis. And, um, and we cry and we laugh. And the thing about it is we love to meet each other because we feel that Nobody else quite understands how we're feeling except one of our other families or one of our other patient advocates. And, you know, just from my perspective, I, I really have to say that one of, the, one of the areas that sort of bothers me working in the whole federal area right now is that uh, my son died from sepsis, but somehow or other it feels to me like his death from sepsis isn't as important as somebody's death from cancer or from a drug overdose. And that really, really gets me because we all shed the same tears and we all tried our best to save our loved ones. And to feel like, you know, there may be a pecking order there just doesn't sit good with me because when I meet other parents, um, one of my best friends, her, her daughter died from an accidental drug overdose. We have no pecking order. We meet, we talk, we love, we have sorrow, and we talk about what we can do to change the world to make it better. So on World Sepsis Day, I really just want to give a shout out to, um, to the wonderful patient advocates that are out there that get up out of bed every day and say, you know what, I want to do something. I just don't want anybody else to experience what I experienced. So um, one of, uh, one, what I'm going to do now is um, introduce you to April Chavez, who um, is a member, is now actually a board member of Ensepsis. Um, April is from Texas, and she's here with her son, oh, sorry, no, excuse me, her son, her husband, Shay, today. Um, April um, and I met through a, a harrowing birth experience that April shared with me um, that she went through with her young son. Um, she, April is a survivor of maternal sepsis, and as you know, maternal sepsis is the second leading cause of death in pregnant women. Um, I don't know, the, the story that April will tell you is just absolutely horrendous. Uh, it's, a, it's a story about how she wasn't listened to. It's a story ha about how she pleaded for help. It's a story about being spoken down to in that, you know, you just had a baby, get over yourself kind of stuff. And it is a story that I've heard over and over again from patient advocates. So um, April has done an awful lot of work in the short time that I've known her. She's joined our board. She's also engaged with Mama's Voices, who you know are an amazing organization. And she's also part of um, an NIH-supported uh, study on maternal sepsis. So. This in addition to running her, her life, and uh, I, I'm just you know, completely full of admiration for this woman, and um, I would love you now to experience what I experienced talking to her, this is April Chavez. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me to celebrate World Sepsis Day with you all. This means so much to me and to my family. As you heard from Orla, I am not a doctor. 
I'm not a nurse. I have no medical background. So why am I here and why am I taking up some of your time today? I'm here because I never want another woman to wake up strapped to a hospital bed with a tube down her throat, wondering where her baby was, wondering if she even had a baby, wondering if this was all a nightmare. I never want another mother or another family to experience what I did. Today I want to share a little bit about my story with you. And it starts of years of praying for a child. After years of being told no that we would never get pregnant, um, my husband and I were so excited to hear that we were finally expecting. Needless to say that I went a little bit overboard. I bought all the baby books I could find. I had a stack that was at least this tall. We took all of the childbirthing classes that my hospital offered and we were excited to be new parents. This was gonna be the start of our fairy tale. Little did I know that my fairy tale would quickly turn into a nightmare. I had a normal birth, everything went fine, my son was healthy, and we were happy. On the day that I was supposed to be discharged, I started to feel terrible. I started to feel like my heart was racing, I started to feel like I couldn't catch my breath, um, I started to run a fever. Um, at one point I was jackhammering in the bed with chills and throughout this whole experience I was not taken seriously. Um, when I was jackhammering in that bed with chills they told me maybe a hot shower will help and they had me take a hot shower. When my chills turned to sweats they brought me a fan. Um, they actually called the maintenance people in the hospital to come and check the thermostat in my room because I was going from fever to chills and just temperature was fluctuating. Um, throughout that time, no one ever listened to me. No matter how much I complained, no matter what I said, I never felt like I was being taken seriously. I always felt like my symptoms were being dismissed and everything they said, well, that can be a a normal symptom after childbirth. You're tired, you're anxious. Everything was just explained away. I knew something was wrong and no one listened to me. The biggest thing that I think hindered my care was they convinced me that I was just anxious about being a new mom. They said I had anxiety and I had struggled with anxiety about 10 years prior to this, so I thought, well, maybe I am just anxious at that time. I didn't know what all these signs and symptoms were. Um, one doctor even told me that I was being crazy and I needed to stop. At that time, I had no idea that those symptoms were signs, urgent maternal warning signs or signs of sepsis. I had never heard the word sepsis before. I had to trust doctors who sent me home with anxiety meds and told me I would feel better once I got home. Only I went home and I didn't feel better. I continued to grow sicker. I couldn't care for my newborn baby. I couldn't care for myself. I couldn't even stand up to walk across the room. I felt terrible. I didn't want to go back to the hospital though because they had already told me everything was fine. They told me I was anxious and they told me I was going to feel better. But my mom convinced me. She said, you have to go back. There's something really wrong. and. I remember driving there and I said, they already told me I'm, I'm just anxious, maybe I am. And I said, what if they tell me I'm crazy again? Because that's what they had told me when I was there the first time. I'm so thankful that my mom made me go back. When I went back to the hospital, I was placed in a triage room, but I continued to be ignored. I felt like anybody who looked at my chart saw anxiety and just thought that I was overreacting. I think that they did a great job convincing me that you're a first time mom, you've never experienced this, this is normal. So I was never listened to. It wasn't until my guardian angel, Trevor, came to help put an IV in me. He took one look at my chart and he knew that something was wrong. He actually broke protocol at the hospital and he wheeled me up to the ICU himself. When I got to the ICU, I was placed in a medically induced coma. This was the first time that my family had ever heard the word sepsis 
or ever heard the word septic shock. My family was told that the odds were not good and I probably wouldn't survive. They told my mom to call loved ones to come and say goodbye. But my mom refused to let anyone come and see me because she felt like if she let people come, she was giving up on me. So my family continued to pray and I continued to fight. The very first thing that I remember in the ICU besides being strapped to that bed and having that tube down my throat and feeling so confused and helpless was tracing my son's name into somebody's hand. It's the very first thing I remember. I later learned that that was my mom's hand and that was the first thing that I did when I woke up. Somehow, I survived. Doctors tried to explain to me that I had developed an infection of an unknown source and was suffering from septic shock. At that time, I had never heard the word sepsis, much like my family. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know that sepsis had killed so many others, like Rory. I had no idea that I had just escaped death. When I finally started gaining strength back, I kept asking them, why didn't you listen to me? And nobody had an answer and everyone kind of tiptoed around me because I feel like they knew that they made a huge mistake and it nearly cost me my life. When I finally made it to a regular room out of the ICU, I had to learn how to walk again. I had to have my husband or my mom help me go to the bathroom, shower. I couldn't stand up by myself. All of this time, it was a little over a month that I was in the hospital. I was fighting to survive and my son was at home. I never got to be that newborn mom that I wanted to be. I missed all those days. But I'm so incredibly thankful that my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law, and my nieces, and countless others in our family all stepped up and they helped take care of my son and he was healthy and he was happy at home. Um, but it shouldn't have been like that. I should have been home with him. They should have listened. After I was discharged, I actually developed blood clots and had to go back to the hospital again. So I missed even more time. I never spent a day as a family with my husband during maternity leave. And even when I got home from the hospital, I wasn't really strong enough to be the mom I wanted to be. I couldn't hold him. I didn't have the strength. I had people taking care of me, and it just wasn't the fairy tale that I had hoped for. The decisions that the medical providers made to brush me off nearly cost me my life. My son almost grew up without a mom. My husband was almost a single dad. Now, we advocate. I never want another mom or another family to experience what my family did. We can do better. It starts with knowing the signs, creating an empowering environment, advocating for your own health or the health of those around you, and listening. Together we can end sepsis. Thank you for your time today. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why we're here. Um, I'm going to suggest the next panel not follow the directions I gave to the first panel and come up here and have to move as we put the um, uh, speaker on uh, on the slide behind on, on the on the um, frame behind. But I will introduce the the group here. Uh, next coming up, we're, we are going to go into new, da new data, new ideas, and natural approach to quality improvement with leaders in the field. 
We'll start off in a moment with Dr. Narav Shah. Um, he was here by video. Um, Narav's on the West Coast. Unlike some of us, he didn't decide to fly east for this. <laughs> um, but just as committed, uh, Narav was the Commissioner of Health um, at the time, Dr. Geston's boss, um, at, at the time that Rory's regulations were created in New York. He is now also a senior scholar at Stanford University and the co-chair of the NSEPSIS National Sepsis Initiative Expert Panel. Um, in addition, in the, in the panel, we have Dr. Qatar Mate. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, but he'll correct it if I'm not, um, who is the president and CEO of what we know as IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. We've already heard reference to Dr. Hallie Prescott in the earlier discussions when Orla talked about the work and the CDC talked about the work. We'll hear from Dr. Prescott herself uh, as part of this. She is an associate professor at the University of Michigan and co-chair of the Survive, Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines. And then a long-term colleague of mine and good friend, um, Dr. Peter Silver, who is the Chief Quality Officer and Associate Chief Medical Officer at Northwell Health. Pete is also advisor to the Children's Hospital Association Improving Pediatric Sepsis Care Outcomes um, as a pediatric intensivist his entire life and also a member of the uh, National Expert Advisory Group. Um, actually, if I could, I should probably be moving slides myself here. Um, yeah, not. Um, could we start with Dr. Shaw's video? Hello, my name is Nirav Shah, and it's an honor to join you virtually for this session on quality improvement in sepsis. I've titled my remarks, Using Synthesis as a Strategy, and so I hope it all comes together by the end. So let me begin. Humans are tribal. We like to classify and look for differences, often focusing more on the edge between one thing and another, rather than looking at the whole together. The practice of medicine itself has followed that trajectory, moving from generalist to specialist, to a stage now that entire physician societies are subspecializing even further. While this has led to enormous advances in our understanding of human condi conditions and diseases, some things have been lost in the process. Especially for complex conditions, that paradox of complexity is that splitting doesn't always lead to better answers. And it also applies to many things around sepsis. Let me give you a few examples. First, our initial approach to understanding sepsis focused on trying to identify and treat sepsis early on in the emergency room and hospital. CMS published a set of measures in 2015 called SCP-1. SCP-1 focused on measuring and reporting things like time to antibiotics. And since then, we've better understood the natural history and course of sepsis, not just early on in the emergency department and day one of the hospital, but beyond extending even to discharge. That broader perspective shows us what else is important. For example, the context of that hospital, its various workflows, and the sophistication of the staff using sepsis protocols matter a lot. The characteristics of the community and the population being served also matter. Another criticism of SCP-1 is that it focuses too much on processes such as time to treatment, that is, the inputs rather than the outcomes, like did the patient survive as a result of all those inputs. In fact, CMS's new sepsis mortality measure is an attempt to address that limitation. So when it comes to CMS mandated measurement, it's not an either or. It's not about process or outcomes or inputs versus outputs. It's a both and. In fact, as Dr. Foster Geston has written, it's about process and outcome and structures that lead to the best results. Let me give you a second example of using synthesis as a strategy. We used to think that by focusing on giving antibiotics early, you may be giving them to many patients who possibly don't need them, 
and as a result, increased rates of antibiotic resistance. That is, by measuring time to treatment, it would lead to unintended consequences of increased antibiotic resistance. Vincent Liu of Kaiser Permanente and Haley Prescott of Michigan have shown us that is not the case. That is, there's a false dichotomy between time to treatment and the rise of superbugs. We can have our cake and eat it too. A final example of synthesis as a strategy relates to the rise of technology and treatment. Jonathan Chen of Stanford and others have published about artificial intelligence and machine learning protocols to help in the early diagnosis of sepsis. Early on, we were disappointed by these algorithms, but over time, we actually began to understand that context matters. A hospital using the EPIC sepsis model had to calibrate that algorithm to the unique context, the structure in Dr. Geston's structure process outcome model. And then it worked. Artificial intelligence focused on antimicrobial stewardship can help us provide individualized, real-time recommendations to doctors on appropriate but narrower spectrum antibiotic options. So it's not about computers replacing humans in the early diagnosis of sepsis. It's computers augmenting clinical judgment, another and instead of an or. We're lucky today to realize the benefits of synthesis as a strategy, first with the 2021 Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines, and just last month with CDC's Hospital Sepsis Program Core Elements. The 2021 guidelines span eight domains of clinical practice, while CDC's approach describes seven core elements, such as leadership, accountability, tracking, and reporting. Both of these efforts are the summation of the learnings of the past decade taking the best evidence and making it actionable for hospitals, administrators, and clinicians. We owe many thanks to Ray Dante, Arjun Srinivasan, Haley Prescott, and numerous others across the CDC, CMS, and the universities who helped make the core elements a reality. Now I'm gonna play Monday morning quarterback for a minute. One of the core elements is about accountability, having two or more people like a doctor and a nurse accountable for program management and outcomes in a healthcare system. My quibble is with the word accountable. I don't wanna be held accountable. I'd rather they take on being responsible. Not that accountability is bad, but when I think of accountable, it comes from a fear-driven place versus responsible to me is more internally motivated. Being responsible is more active and engaged. It suggests you are capable. And responsibility can be shared. Accountability cannot. Ultimately, being accountable versus responsible boils down to being a taker versus a giver. When you're accountable, you need things to get to a certain place. You play to the test and you look to maximize your resources to achieve a certain result. And maybe the bar was set too low. When you're responsible, however, you're driven by a higher purpose and collectively, you come from a place of abundance that will help all boats rise together. Being responsible requires sharing and results in good karma. But I digress. Let me end with why we are all here. It's been seven hours and 15 days and 11 and a half years since we lost Rory Staunton to sepsis. What Rory has taught me is that in that time, there's a great power of interdependence, the both and, the synthesis that can emerge from the dialectics that we face each day. He's shown me that the sum can be greater than its parts and that when we share responsibility, real progress can be made. Thank you. He's not here to hear the applause, but we'll tell him about it. <laughs> sort of sitting there, do you applaud when someone's on the screen? <laughs> um, so next I have the IHI president and CEO. Uh, Kadar, I see you coming up. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Look forward to hearing your wisdom. Well, thank you so much, Marty. It's really a pleasure to be with all of you here. Um, 
I'm tempted, I have to say, um, right at the beginning of this to cede my time to Ms. Chavez. Um, April, thank you so much for providing your comments and your, and your experience. Um, I think uh, maybe the key message of what I have to offer is listen to you. Um, listen to April. Um, listen to what you have to say uh, every time, everywhere, with every patient encounter that we have. Uh, that's probably the signal most important intervention, along with oxygen, fluids, and medications. Uh, probably the most important medication we can offer to end sepsis is to do what you so eloquently and poignantly described, which is the need to listen to you. Um, I uh, am a physician. I'm an internist at New York Presbyterian, um, competitor to Northwell. Sorry, guys. Um, oh, sorry, you. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. I have the uh, privilege of taking care of patients in Manhattan, in the uh, Upper East Side of Manhattan. Um, and I remember the day uh, when uh, Rory, when we lost Rory. Um, I didn't know uh, Kieran and Orlath. I didn't know you at that time. Uh, but I knew your son's story. Um, everybody did in New York um, when it happened. Every practicing physician um, in New York City, in New York State, and perhaps I might argue in in our country, uh, became very quickly aware of the pernicious effects of sepsis on our patients um, and what it can cause in terms of human loss. Uh, I remember uh, the day when I heard about this, uh, our department chief called a meeting of all of us, um, all of the hospital medicine docs in the, in the department, and we sat around the table and we talked about cases that we'd experienced uh, near misses around sepsis, things that we thought we didn't have. And I went back to my list of patients that day. There were six patients out of 18 in my roster that, that afternoon uh, who were there either with uh, sepsis as a primary cause of hospital admission or as a complication of their admission. Um, and I remember very clearly during that time also thinking uh, about the other six patients that were not on my list, whose diagnosis we had not caught, um, whose uh, error, through a series of errors that we had missed uh, as a result of our um, the challenges of diagnosis. Um, so I, I just want to share with you, Orlath and, and Kieran, um, your experience um, in, in Rory's legacy uh, taught all of us so much. Um, and we thank you for what you're doing now. Um, and I cannot imagine the insufferable loss that you've collectively experienced. Um, I don't know if my slides are here. I hope they are. If they're not, that's okay. Um, oh, they're there. Great. Um, I can't advance, so please go ahead to the next slide. Um, you know, this is a uh, probably not surprisingly a tale that you guys, uh, I don't need to explain to this room. We've already talked a lot about this in the context of this conversation. Uh, a lot has been said about the fact that we have available tools to help end sepsis, um, and yet uh, we have many, uh, I would argue, places where we've tremendous uh, areas of excellence. Northwell, we had the pleasure of working with Marty, um, Michael, and many others at Northwell for many years. Uh, thank you, Marty, for your words earlier. Uh, after Rory's uh, untimely passing, we had a chance to work with Northwell uh, because Michael prioritized it, because Marty uh, got engaged in a really powerful way, uh, uh, and because Northwell had made a decision to end sepsis or to do as much as Northwell could do to end sepsis. And the results that Michael described in his opening comments are testimony to what can be done if we take action on sepsis um, in every system in the country. Lots of islands of excellence like Northwell, I'd say we have architected beautiful archipelagos of excellence across the country. Uh, but unfortunately, we still have, uh, sorry, I can't do this, but please go ahead and advance. We unfortunately still have lots of people losing their lives to go ahead to the to sepsis. Can you advance? Sorry, I don't know how to do this. Okay, there we go. Does it work? Sort of. Okay, the down button. Thank you. Um, so I, there's lots of ways of describing the the effects. The, the simplest way that I think of when I think of sepsis is that it's the number one cause of in hospital death. It's the number one cause of readmissions, and it's the number one cost in hospital. So whether you are, uh, I think we should be in it for all of the reasons that we've described here today. Uh, but this is the number one cause of significant in hospital morbidity, mortality, as well as cost. And so we've got a tremendous opportunity to work on this. And despite the fact that I'm pushing down, it's still not working. I'm sorry, I don't know what to do. Uh, just keep advancing. We just click through because uh, uh, if you want, um, keep going. So I would think of the failure modes in sepsis, the way that I think of this, I'm a, I'm a systems um, improvement uh, engineer and, and expert. This is my 
Uh, the IHI, the Institute for Quality Imp Health Healthcare Improvement, is a quality improvement patient safety organization. We work on thinking about how the problems that happen are not necessarily simply due to human failure, but the fact that we haven't produced systems that are capable of uh, tackling sepsis consistently every time. So I think of three primary failure modes or problems, one of recognition, the other of reliability, and the third of scale. And if we answer those three problems, we have a chance at ending sepsis. But fundamentally, sepsis is a socio-technical problem. By that I mean it's a technical and a social problem. So we have lots of technical solutions, some of which have already been elaborated, I won't belabor them, but we also have significant social challenges on this. Uh, problems like climate change, uh, the spread of disinformation or misinformation, these are soci other similar socio-technical problems. They have technical solutions, but they also require social changes. If you go to the next slide for a second, you'll see that what we need for socio-technical problems, as they're called, are similarly suited socio-technical solutions. These are uh, a, sort of a simple way of describing a socio-technical solution is that it's person-centered. It mines the story that April uh, gave us. It, it, makes, it centers the person, the patient, and, and in some cases the provider in the solution. It solves the right problem. And it does so thinking about systems, not just about individuals. And it does through, so through a learning method, a learning model, so that we iterate it through cycles of change ideas um, for what we could do differently. Quality science, the, the area that I'm uh, a specialist in, that the Institute for Healthcare Improvement is an expert in, is a socio-technical socio solution to this problem. But before I get into the features of that, I want to share uh, something that I think Dr. Cardo mentioned in her remarks earlier, um, this notion that we have to not just uh, focus on the technical, but we have to believe that there is actually a, a solution out there. So if you go to the next slide for a second. Uh, just a short detour into a different kind of socio-technical problem, and that's the problem of car traffic accidents and comparing that to aviation accidents. Um, in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, we had about 2,000 people die every year in aviation accidents. Today, that number is infinitesimally small. It's 0.01. Um, and so every year about two people die in commercial aviation accidents. So it's much, much, much smaller than that. Compare that to uh, what happens to road traffic today. Today driving a motor vehicle is one of the riskiest things you can do in the country. We suffer uh, in, a, in about a, annually, we suffer about 40,000 lost lives in traffic accidents every year. Um, and it's very interesting because we believe that this is just a feature of our roads, a feature of our traffic systems. If you read the papers about this, um, it's almost as if loss of life through motor vehicle accidents is a weather pattern, uh, inevitable in our society, something that's immutable and unchangeable. In some ways, that was the way that aviation was 20, 30 years ago, as if dying or having people lost uh, to aviation accidents was a feature of the system. Um, what can be done about motor vehicle accidents uh, is been done in many countries now across the world. Uh, Canada, the Netherlands, Belgium, the UK have halved motor vehicle accident deaths because they believed that they could do something differently. They believed that motor vehicle accident death was not an inevitability, but it was in fact something that could be cured. So they put in traffic circles, traffic calming lanes, etc. We've done that here in the United States. In New York City, uh, to credit New York with another thing, I'm sorry, this is like the New York love fest, but to credit New York with another thing, they've reduced traffic accident deaths by 34% in three years because they put in place uh, the traffic speed limitations, speed bumps, uh, traffic uh, calming, what they call traffic calming areas, I don't really know, I'm not, a, I'm not a transportation engineer, so I know nothing about this, but it's pretty amazing what you can do uh, when you actually set your mind to doing it. In healthcare, I remember about two decades ago, when we put patients on a ventilator, um, we accepted a certain rate of harm associated with a ventilator. We believed that when you put an endotracheal tube into a patient and you put them on a, hook them up to a machine to ventilate them, that a certain number of those patients would develop a complication known as ventilator-associated pneumonia. We believed that that error rate or that complication rate was about 10 in every 1,000 patients that we intubated. This was 20 years ago. When IHI started working on this problem around that time, we asked ourselves this question, can we eliminate ventilator-associated pneumonia deaths? Why is it an inevitability? That, why is it something that we just naturally believed was impossible to avoid? 
And by asking that question, we started to create change ideas and concepts that might have the capability of eliminating ventilator-associated pneumonia deaths. And the striking or important thing that's happened since then is that we have many ICUs, including several at, at Northwell now, that have gone not just days or weeks or months without a ventilator-associated pneumonia, but in some cases years without a ventilator-associated pneumonia. So it's possible when we change our mindsets to believe that we can eliminate certain causes of uh, premature or uh, morbidity or mortality, we can in fact change those things. So if you go to the next slide for a second, with, those, uh, with that mindset change in mind, there are a few technical solutions that I want to talk about very briefly and then I'll conclude. And they come to the three failure modes that I described earlier. The failure to recognize, the failure to reliably treat, and the failure to scale what we know. Uh, several of which have been described in conversation already here today. If you go to the next slide, um, Nirav just mentioned um, this notion of technology enablement. Um, I, I, earlier in the presentations, I, I, I think it was Dr. Guestin who put up a slide, or, or maybe it was uh, um, uh, Dr. Valdez who put up a slide that showed how dramatically uh, New York had reduced uh, causes of uh, 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 sepsis or prevented sepsis uh, uh, death. Um, the same, I, I was struck by the number, it was about 18% reduction in sepsis death over three years. In this study, an AI-powered algorithm, uh, this is led by uh, investigators at Hopkins, an AI-powered algorithm to recognize sepsis early in six months had the same effect of reducing sepsis-related mortality by 18%. So I think this is our future in terms of recognition. Uh, the technology is available. Uh, it's being utilized right now. There are problems with it, sure. But I am quite certain that we're going to see something like this in every emergency department in the country in the near future, if not already to some extent in, in, our, in our practice environments. And they have a significant impact on reducing time to delivery of critical interventions, which ultimately has the effect of reducing sepsis death. The second area is about reliability. Um, to move from islands of excellence to scaled systems, if you go to the next slide, we have to tackle the problem of getting every hospital in the country to do the kinds of things that Northwell has done. Now, it's nice to say it's a platitude. You hear it in conferences like this one or other such meetings. But how on earth do we do it? Uh, how on earth do we actually materially move every hospital in the country to, in a disciplined and regular fashion, do the things we know works? This is the problem with reliability. We have a whole bunch of things. And we can add sepsis to the left side of this slide, right? Or we can add cancer care. We can add, you name, you name the cause of pre premature morbidity and mortality. There are meetings like this, I promise you, happening around the country on other topics of interest. The problem is that we filter those priorities to the frontline caregiver, in this case, a nurse at the front line, and ask him, her, or they to do the things that are necessary to get done reliably as if each of those priorities is a separate thing that they need to do every day. Now, imagine there are about 10,000 ICD codes, I think there's 100,000 actually, but like 10,000 material ones that we use on a regular basis. If every one of those ICD codes asked for three things to do, oxygen, early fluids, and antibiotics, that's 30,000 actions we're asking a frontline nurse to think about every day. That's an impossible human conundrum. So we need, I would argue, a different approach to reliably implementing a better program for doing this work. The problem is right now, we take all of these different priorities, we filter them through some improvement stuff, as I call it, um, some culture work, uh, sometimes it's called, and then we expect the frontline teams to do things with reliability and carefulness. This is impossible. It's a system designed for failure, as we talk about at IHI. If you go to the next slide, this is how we like to think about it, and think about it differently, and I'm going to show you a system that's doing it this way. Um, instead of operating the way that I just described with a system, series of priorities, push to the front line, the front line needs to be describing what they need. And then we need to give them an operating system to enable their work so that they can produce outcomes, as we've talked about here, that are consistent with the quality, safety, equity, and value goals that we have for our system. So what does such a system look like? Here's uh, one system from Prisma Health that we've had a chance to work with in part over the last, if you go to the next slide, please, thank you. Um, this is Prisma. Prisma is an 18 hospital system in South Carolina. Uh, just to provide at least one other place to, to discuss, not just New York. Um, I'm sure that Northwell has a version of this. I'm confident that they do. Uh, but this is a program for reliably creating better quality and safety at every 
care interaction across their 18 hospital and 300 plus primary care clinics that are part of the Prisma system. Uh, it's, they, they've branded it, they call it the Pulse program. I, I won't get into all the details of exactly what's in the program as that'll take me a lot longer and you, I'll bore you completely. But the essence of it is it's a safety management system that provides data to the frontline care teams about risk in real time. So the question that was asked earlier about how on earth are we gonna know about mortality or morbidity risk in real time so that people could do something today, that's what this system does. It provides that kind of information to frontline care teams in the moment to take action now, not next week when the opportunity is lost and the patient is lost, uh, but today, now, when we need it. Um, and these are the elements of that system. On uh, the next slide, you'll see some of the results. This is again, uh, this is an 18 hospital system. So this is a big system, not unlike Northwell in, si in size. Um, mortality in this system, in the aggregate, as a result of some of the work that's being done on this, is down by over 40%. Sepsis mortality, in particular, down by fi over 50%. And uh, days, excess, what's known as excess days in acute care. That's days that someone shouldn't be in the hospital any longer, or days past the, the point where they should be returned to their home care setting or their home setting. They're down seven days. So they're seven days less spent in the hospital relative, for any given patient relative to their condition. If you go to the next slide, um, I want to talk last about scaling. So uh, recognition, reliability, like the system I just described at Prisma. And the last question is, how do we get to national scale? And here, one last story from transportation, this one from aviation. Um, many years ago, in the 80s and early 90s, aviation safety had plateaued. They thought they had reached the, the apex of aviation safety. You know, around 2,000 uh, lives were being lost in commercial aviation every year, but that's a heck of a lot better than it was sort of 30 years before that, when there were tens of thousands lives being lost in aviation, commercial aviation at the time. And so the thought was that we had they it, it leveled off; that there wasn't anything else to do. But this is where a very important public-private partnership uh, became came into effect. It was the leadership of the FAA at the time together with all of the commercial aviation operators, uh, United Airlines, Delta, you know, et cetera, um, and their precursors, um, they came together along with the manufacturers to establish something called the Commercial Aviation Safety Team. And the premise of the cast, as it was known, Commercial Aviation Safety Team, the premise of it was to share data. The incident rate of any particular tragic aviation event was low, relatively low for any given uh, operator. But put together, they could amass sufficient data to actually provide comment on any given, on the risks that were present in aviation at the time. And if you just click for a second, this is the effect of that. After they thought they had plateaued in aviation safety, from that point forward, they further reduced uh, safety in commercial aviation by 83% to the point now where we only lose around two lives every year um, in aircraft-related uh, issues. Um, and so it is, in fact, much, much, much safer to travel in an aircraft than it is in your car, as it turns out. Um, so we need something like this in healthcare. We need a healthcare version of the commercial aviation safety team, a public-private partnership. The agencies at HHS, thank you all for being here, the agencies in HHS combining forces with the private sector hospital systems like Northwell, the public sector hospital systems like our safety net institutions, to try to create a systematic approach, data-driven, on sepsis and other uh, safety-related concerns so that we are radically eliminating the risk of injury and harm in, to our patients. Uh, the good news is last week, next slide, the uh, President's Council for, uh, for uh, uh, Safety in Healthcare, the PCAST as it's known, um, had a, a report released in which they called for exactly the same thing that I'm asking for here today. Uh, I don't know whether this will happen. I hope Biden pays attention and uh, endorses this thing. But honestly, this, is, this could be a real breakthrough for patient safety in the United States um, and specifically for our goal here today of ending sepsis. Thank you very much. The next slide is just a summary. But thank you so much for having me here. And Marty, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, I want to just tie two pieces together here. Uh, we had CMS talk before on the financial aspects and, the, and penalty and such, and Kadari just talked to, made real quickly here the excess days. Um, for the lay uh, audience, may not recognize that hospitals get paid based upon the diagnosis 
and it's a fixed payment for the vast majority of Medicare patients. And then the costs that they incur are based upon, to a good extent, how many days that patient stays in the hospital. And so if the payment aligns with fewer hospital days, there is a significant opportunity for the hospital to be in better financial state. And so those type of combinations of, of collective outcomes beyond the benefits of having less harm to patients, and as Dr. Tracy talked before, less consequences of being in the ICU in the hospital too long, the cascade of all of this is, 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 is um, additive, if not synergistic. Um, with that, I'd like to bring up Dr. Prescott. We've heard a lot about her so far today, and so maybe we can now hear from her. Dr. Prescott, if you don't mind. Well, it's really um, an honor and a pleasure to be here today. Um, um, I'm Hallie Prescott. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician. I work at the University of Michigan and then also at the Ann Arbor VA Hospital. Um, and today I'll be talking about HMS sepsis. This is a statewide um, quality improvement initiative in sepsis. And so I'll tell you kind of our story um, as a, you know, a potential model of what can be done in other states. It's not New York. It's not New York. <laughs> um, so I have no financial conflicts of interest. I have pertinent roles you've heard about. I lead this initiative. I'm also co-chair of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines. I have funding and salary support for research and work related to sepsis. Um, and then the HMS Sepsis Initiative specifically is funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Um, so in terms of the outline, I'll talk about the Hospital Medicine Safety Consortium. This is kind of the broader framework uh, within which the sepsis initiative lives. I'll talk some more details of what we do with the sepsis initiative. Um, and then I think key features of our initiative that I think are instrumental for the success of the program. Um, so the Hospital Medicine Safety uh, Consortium is one of about 20 collaborative quality initiatives that's funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. This is part of their value partnerships program, essentially money that they invest to try to improve the quality and also reduce the costs of medical care in the state of Michigan. Um, these programs have been going on now for over 20 years, um, and you can see a lot of them relate to sort of surgical or procedural care, but sepsis lives within this um, hospital medicine safety that focuses broadly on improving care and outcomes in hospitalized medical patients. Um, so Blue Cross invests a lot of money into these programs, but they have a good return on investment. By their own estimates, they believe that these programs have saved uh, over 400 million to them as an organization and over a billion to the state as a result of reduced complications, you know, reduced hospital readmissions, et cetera. Um, so in terms of the operational model, um, Blue Cross um, funds the initiative. They provide money to the coordinating center, which is run at University of Michigan, as well as um, direct payments to the hospitals to participate in these initiatives. Um, at the coordinating center, we run a data registry. We generate feedback reports. We set performance targets, which are changed annually. Um, we facilitate quality improvement at the hospitals, um, and then we convene collaborative-wide meetings. So we meet three times a year with all of our member hospitals. Um, the hospitals submit data into our registry. Um, okay. Uh, receive performance reports, implement local quality improvement, and then share their challenges and also their successes at our collaborative-wide meetings so hospitals really across the state of Michigan can learn together to learn what works and implement that in their hospitals. Um, so currently there are 69 diverse hospitals that participate in our initiative. Essentially that's all larger, all medium-sized hospitals in Michigan as well as many of the smaller hospitals. This ranges from, you know, large centers in Detroit to, you know, small hospitals in the rural upper peninsula of Michigan all coming together across different hospital systems to learn and improve care together. Um, I've got a picture of our coordinating center. There's a lot of people who are working on this. Um, uh, that really sort of support the infrastructure for the, you know, the data, uh, the quality improvement, you know, convening the meetings, et cetera. 
Um, and then on the right, I show the five initiatives that have been run thus far. Sepsis is our newest initiative, and actually the funding for sepsis started on January 1 of 2020. Um, and sort of very quickly, of course, we then found ourselves um, you know, in the COVID pandemic when we were still just in this kind of early planning phase. Um, so we you know, then kind of pivoted a little bit and did uh, an initiative related to COVID-19 for about a year year and a half maybe before sort of resuming and sort of merging the COVID work into the, uh, the sepsis initiative. Um, we've been onboarding our hospitals and um, just as of March of this year now we have all 69 hospitals in our state submitting their data into our registry. Um, so why sepsis? Obviously everybody here knows how important this problem is, but why did Blue Cross um, decide to fund a sepsis initiative? Um, it was a growing concern for their organization and also their customers, okay? So I think this is a story of how advocacy actually really made a difference in our state because it's big corporations like Auto Workers of America that are buying health insurance for thousands of people that were going to Blue Cross and saying, this is a really important problem. What are you doing to help improve sepsis care and outcomes in the state of Michigan? And so they, you know, the corporations were coming to Blue Cross saying sepsis is a major driver of hospitalizations in our beneficiaries. Uh, not, um, high mortality. And then sepsis is also having a lasting impact on our employees and limiting their ability to return to work. Um, so again, I think advocacy was really important in sort of bringing resources to address the problem in our state. Um, oops. So how do we identify sepsis hospitalization? So we use a two-step process. Um, we identify potential, hosp potential um, hospitalizations for sepsis based on like a broad number of diagnostic codes. That includes, of course, sepsis, but also other infections like COVID and flu. And that's because we know that there is variable recognition and labeling of sepsis across hospitals and also over time. And so we want to have sort of a standard and consistent definition across all of our hospitals. So we sort of pull in a broader group of hospitalizations and we then apply the CDC surveillance criteria to identify a consistent set of hospitalizations across all of our hospitals. And so a random sample get abstracted into our registry then for the purposes of performance evaluation. Um, so what do we measure? We've heard a lot today about the three pillars of quality improvement, structure, processes, and outcomes. Um, and we look at all of these things. So we measure structure through a twice a year um, survey to our hospitals where we ask questions related to their policies, protocols, services, staffing to understand what's happening. Um, in terms of processes, we get this from the chart abstracted data. Um, and we currently track about 30 different processes of care that are organized into four bundles. So this includes the very early sepsis care, similar to what is measured in the SEP1 measure, um, but also kind of early care in the first couple days, um, ICU to floor transition. We know transitions are a period um, uh, with increased risk for patient safety events. So we have uh, elements related to that transition. Um, and then peri-discharge care. We've heard a lot about kind of the longer term and lasting impacts of sepsis. We think there's a big opportunity to improve the transition from in hospital to outpatient. So we have a, you know, a broader focus to this initiative. Um, and I put a, uh, a logo there for the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. We really try to lean into processes that have really strong evidence from Surviving Sepsis Campaign as well as other guidelines that would be pertinent to patients with sepsis. And then in terms of outcomes, um, we measure this through a variety of ways, um, through the chart abstraction to understand what happened in that hospitalization, data linkages to understand what happens afterwards in terms of readmissions or post-acute, like post-hospital mortality. Half of all deaths in our state in the first 90 days occur post-hospital discharge. So there's a huge or high rate of mortality in that first you know, month to two months after discharge. And then we also call our patients on the telephone at 90 days. So we collect new disability using the World Health Organization Disability Assessment Schedule. We see about a quarter of our patients reporting substantial new disability, many patients not able to return to work. Um, and then we also collect measures about financial toxicity, um, the sort of impacts directly on our patients' financial health as a result of being hospitalized. 
Um, so here are just a few slides or a few graphs that show substantial practice variation. So as I mentioned, we've just gotten all of our hospitals on board. This is kind of like our baseline and as our initiative goes forward, we will work to reduce the variation. But this is a really important piece because it tells us where are the most kind of important actionable places to focus our initiative. So on the top right, you'll see antibiotics within three hours of presentation. That's patients who present with sepsis and are hypotensive um, upon arrival or shortly after arrival to emergency department. And each of those bars shows you know, a different hospital in our initiative. So you can see substantial variation and I think room for improvement really across the board. On the bottom is about the type of fluid we're resuscitating with, and on the right are some of the peri-discharge measures. So at the top right, you'll see providing a hospital contact at discharge. A lot of people get discharge instructions that say, oh, if you have an issue, call your primary care doctor, go to 911, go to the ER. But we really think it's important to have a mechanism if you get home and say, gosh, you know, I know they told me I need to take this medicine, now I can't remember why. It's been two hours since you were discharged. We think there should be a way to get back in touch with your doctors and get those questions answered. And you can see, we got a handful of hospitals that are at nearly 100%. They have implemented mechanisms to do that. And then you can see a bunch kind of in that, you know, 30 to 80%. That's because other hospitals are kind of in the process of bringing these systems on board and we're hoping to, you know, move this across the state. Same thing, outpatient follow-up schedule. A lot of patients are discharged with, oh, yep, you need a whole bunch of follow-up. Please make sure you go and schedule that after discharge. And we think that we can do more to help coordinate that discharge and um, continue the care into the outpatient setting. Um, so how do we work to improve performance, right? So a lot of what we do is performance measurement, identifying actionable targets, but now we want to improve care. So we do audit and feedback. We've got a quarterly report. We also have a live website. So as soon as data is in the registry, patients or hospitals can see it in real time. Um, we kind of pool together tools and resources, um, things like educational tools, documentation tools, order sets, protocols. We're currently working to build a comprehensive toolkit that will go live in November um, for our hospitals, but really it will be accessible to anybody um, on our website. And it's gonna be organized around the hospital sepsis program core elements. So for each of those core elements, we will have literature um, and different sort of tools that we've identified to help hospitals achieve these core elements. And we're, you know, we're sort of using the diversity of hospitals that we have to identify things that are working in you know, smaller hospitals as well as bigger hospitals, recognizing that we really need to provide a few different examples of how these things can be done because not all hospitals are the same. Um, networking, again, we bring our hospitals together three times a year. I think that's really important um, for hospitals to be able to interact um, and learn from each other. We have a performance index. Um, so hospitals get scored yearly, like a report card, um, and they get points based on participation. That's timely and accurate submission of data. That's coming and participating in collaborative-wide meetings. And then they get points based on performance, and that's in the processes of care that we select for inclusion into the performance index. And this is directly tied to financial incentives. So there's a strong incentive for our hospitals to participate and to improve care. And then finally, we do hospital site visits. So this is where we go to the hospitals um, if they're interested, learn about their programs and make you know, recommendations for things that you know, they could do um, to further improve their programs. So this model has had a long track record of success. This is a paper from Health Affairs a number of years ago now, but is a study that was looking at outcomes from bariatric surgery, from our bariatric surgery collaborative, showing that when you look at the trends over time in Michigan hospitals, you're seeing improvements above and beyond trends seen in sort of other states. Um, and again, showing both improved outcomes, reduced costs of care. HMS, uh, we have the same thing, so we track these measures over time as we roll out our initiatives. These are data from our blood clot prevention, our intravenous catheter use, antimicrobial use, and so like I mentioned, we're just getting going with sepsis, but stay tuned because this is what we'll be tracking as we you know, roll out our initiatives um, and start adding sepsis measures into our performance index for the coming year. Um, so what are the key elements of success? Kind of wrapping up here, I think that there's a number of things. I think it's clinician-led, right? Blue Cross empowers clinicians to run these programs and to set the targets. I think that's important. That's kind of bottom-up. 
Um, we have a robust data registry, right? So we have 30 measures and the inclusion and exclusion criteria is different for every single one. We can bring a lot of kind of clinical nuance so that people kind of trust the data. Um, we're able to set rigorous performance targets that we update every year because we can look at the distribution and nudge hospitals forward year upon year. Um, we have financial support, so hospitals receive funding that supports the data abstraction and also quality improvement work. Paper performance is a strong incentive, as is the public reporting of identifiable data across our hospitals in our collaborative-wide meetings. And then again, I think bringing the hospitals together to network, collaborate, and learn from each other. So key lessons for me, I think this granular local data is so important to driving change. People want to know how their hospital and their state is doing. Hospitals really need to understand and buy into the data. People often ask, well, why don't you just like, you know, suck down the data from the electronic health record? Um, one of the reasons is I think that it's, it's been really important that our hospitals trust and believe this data and act on it. And so that's been one of the reasons why we haven't yet gone to a model. We kind of use some things to assist with the data abstraction, but there's still a human abstracting that data. Cross-hospital collaboration, really important, I think, can speed implementation and learning. And then again, these things take resources, but as I've mentioned, the return on investment is huge. So I'll close there. Thank you. Well, it's often been said relative to changes in government that the states are the laboratory of change. And I think what we're seeing here is, is evidence that with regard to improving patient care, the same thing is true. And I'll call out again one of the uh, chief goals of the Patient Family Councils, um, which NSEPS has been working to um, establish around the, the country, uh, is to drive exactly those type of things. Um, with that, uh, again, I'd like to invite up Dr. Pete Silver. Um, who is the Chief Quality Officer for Northwell Health uh, and a pediatric intensivist who has dedicated his professional life to the front lines of providing the type of care that we're seeking to have everybody provide. Um, Pete, thank you. Thank you. I see the top of the first slide is cut off. I hope that's not a recurrent theme. Uh, we'll see. It uh, was uh, a lot of pictures in here, so it's... Um, may have been an issue with, with the emailing the, the, the slide set. So as Marty said, my name's Pete Silver. I'm the Chief Quality Officer of Northwell Health, uh, and I'm a pediatric intensivist. I've been treating children uh, and teens with sepsis for, for 30 years, 12-year-olds uh, just, like, just like Rory. Um, I can't help but think that uh, a lot of mentions of pediatric sepsis Dr. Cardo's slide where she had the pictures, I counted at least six of the 13 were children. There may have been others who were teenagers. Uh, and so thank you for calling out pediatric sepsis and maternal sepsis too. Um, and we really, when we talk about, I'm, I'm off topic already, Marty, but when we talk about maternal That's sepsis, <laughs> We, we really have to remember uh, disparities in, in social determinants of care because uh, maternal sepsis doesn't affect all women equally. It's the down button. So Northwell, 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 this is Northwell. Let me just get this out of the way. We are um, the largest health system in New York. Uh, how does it relate to sepsis? Uh, just a bunch of numbers, but the important one is 850,000 emergency visits. We care for 2 million people uh, in our area. So we're a very large provider of, of sepsis care. And you heard from Michael Dowling, our CEO, it is our moral obligation to maintain and improve the health of those two million people, and sepsis care is part of that. Uh, you met Izzy Friedman. I also want to call out uh, Dr. Mark Sands in the back, who is our chief of clinical transformation. Um, is trying to fill the very large shoes left behind by Marty, uh, and, and Mark is leading our sepsis efforts. But what I'm here to talk about today is pediatric sepsis, specifically uh, Children's Hospital Association's uh, collaborative on improving pediatric sepsis. 
uh, outcomes, or what we call IPSO, I-P-S-O. Uh, and before I, I go any further, I just want to acknowledge and thank uh, CHA for their sponsorship in gathering what ended up being more than 60 children's hospitals. You'll see the map uh, in, in a moment. Uh, and also for their um, use of their data analytics and quality improvement teams to help us improve uh, sepsis care for children across the country. Now, why IPSO? How did we get started? Well, it actually got started when we were working on another collaborative. We were, uh, through CHA, had brought a bunch of children's hospitals, about 40 children's hospitals all together to move the needle on something else we were told we'd never be able to move the needle on. Uh, KDAR, it's like uh, car accidents, right? Central line infections. You're never going to budge central line. It's part of health care. You're never going to budge. Well, we took elements of quality improvement science. We looked for features of highly reliable organizations. And we reduced the incidence of central line blood infections in children's in participating children's hospitals by 80%. We prevented thousands of infections with a mortality rate of 11%. Obviously, we saved hundreds of lives. And as we were wrapping that uh, initiative up, we said, what's next? What can we do to make an, an impact? And sepsis was the obvious answer. And here are some statistics uh, detailing how uh, sepsis affects children in the United States. Worldwide, it has an even greater impact. Uh, infection is the number one cause of death of children. Uh, worldwide. Uh, in the U.S., uh, sepsis mortality rates range depending on... That was me touching the screen, say, uh, uh, between 3.7 to 20 percent. We kind of redefined it and came up with a little bit of, uh, of different, um, different statistics. So in 2015, um, uh, in a meeting that was held here in Washington, um, right, uh, it was the day after the Super Bowl with New England, Seattle, right, that crazy interception, I'll never forget it. Um, uh, we launched IPSO with the formation of a national expert advisory group. We had 60 people from around the country, uh, multiple disciplines, uh, uh, physicians, nurses, critical care, infectious disease, et cetera. Um, and we um, developed guidance recommendations for the formation of this pediatric sepsis collaborative. And what you'll see is we developed, uh, this was the structure that we developed. We broke it down by care settings. Uh, you see the dark blue uh, vertical columns, pediatric uh, emergency department, general care, ICU, oncology. The ones that are in gray are placeholders for future work. And then in the horizontal uh, uh, rows, we have cross-cutting functional work groups, uh, clinical specialists, infectious disease, people who work in all these, uh, um, in all these settings, uh, surgery, pharmacy, right? Is pharmacy important to sepsis care? You, you bet it is. Uh, respiratory therapy, interventions, data and analytics. And I want to call out the bottom three rows, education, right? Look at the difference in outcomes between Sally Quinn's daughter-in-law, who when she presented to the emergency room, they were almost expecting sepsis, right? Look at how quickly they treated her. And then look at April's story. And April, I'm just so struck by your story. And lis listen to April, boy, if that's, that's lesson, lesson one. Family engagement. How critical is family engagement? Who knows the patient better? Who will be going home with the patient? And research, right? Research, collaboration, sharing of data. Uh, we developed this key uh, driver diagram. Uh, we had two, uh, two um, aims. Uh, one was to reduce the incidence of hospital onset critical sepsis. We redefined septic shock as critical sepsis by 25%. And a, to reduce sepsis attributable mortality by, 20, uh, by 25 percent. Our key drivers were prevention, prevention of sepsis in hospitals, and recognition, diagnostic evaluation, resuscitation and stabilization, fluid, oxygen, fluid, antibiotics, de-escalation, right? We've spoken about 
Uh, antibiotic stewardship, again, another major aim of, of, of the CDC, and, and we've already discussed how the two are not in conflict. We tried to ensure that they weren't in conflict by having an active de-escalation process of discontinuing or narrowing the focus of antibiotics. Again, patient and family engagement in optimizing performance. How do we optimize performance? By data sharing, data transparency, right? So all of our sites, there ended up being 62 sites altogether. Not only was data collected centrally by IPSO and sent to that system, hospital system leadership, this is what your hospital's doing, but it was shared among all 62 sites, right? And who were key leaders, who were leaders, who weren't. And it wasn't necessarily for that competition, but it was who can we go to to give us, a, who can we learn from? You know, there was just some friendly banter between Marty and, and Kadar about, you know, New York Presby and Northwell. But they're kidding, because we know in quality, there is no competition in quality, right? It's all share, all learn. And, and that's how you optimize performance. It's not done one emergency room or one hospital at a time. It, it's best done if we all do it together. We redefine sepsis a little bit differently. Um, in most collaboratives, sepsis is defined by the coding, right? So you all know, right? And if you don't, a, a patient is discharged, the, code goes, the, the chart goes, it used to go downstairs, now it's all electronic. But it goes to a coder who's sitting in a dark room somewhere and they go through the chart and they say this was sepsis. This wasn't sepsis based on some of the documentation. But April, you know, when you were in the emergency room, they didn't know you had sepsis, right? When you left, they didn't know you had sepsis. It may not have ever been written as sepsis. So we changed the definition of sepsis. We calling it suspected sepsis, right? If there was a clinician who was treating a patient in the emergency room for sepsis, suspected sepsis, this is a child who has fever, high heart rate, delayed capillary refill and the blood pressure is, is, is low. Whether or not that ended up being coded for sepsis or not, we define that as sepsis. We want to go all out, right? We want oxygen, fluid, antibiotics, ASAP, right? And that that's, was our definition. And so this is a, a fancy, what we call the waterfall diagram of sepsis. It includes not only coding, but whether a child received antibiotics with fluids or antibiotic with fluids in a vasoactive med, a medicine designed to improve blood pressure, we counted that all in our definition of sepsis. Uh, we've heard a lot about uh, uh, process measures. Our, our bundle compliance, our process measure was recognition, right? Recognition is defined by a positive screen. Our hospitals developed screening tools, many of which were incorporated into their electronic medical record, a BPA, a best practice alert. Again, a child comes in with heart rate, high heart rate and fever, ping, it comes up on the screen, artificial intelligence. Maybe there are risk factors involved. It's all a mathematical algorithm, right? A patient with cancer who's been on chemotherapy is at a much greater risk for sepsis than a child who isn't. And all of that's put into the, the BPA for electronic alerts. Once the electronic alert happens, we expect a sepsis huddle, right? The, the, the leaders in that unit, whether it's the emergency room, the ICU, the cancer unit, come together and say, does this patient have sepsis, yes, no. If it's yes, we expect activation of an order set. If no, reassessment in four hours. So that is the recognition bundle plus fluids in an hour, plus antibiotics in three hours, all or none. We developed a leadership group, 25 people uh, from our 60 member uh, uh, NIAC, and you'll see they're cross-discipline, physicians, nurses, uh, parents, et cetera, and from children's hospitals all across the country. Uh, and this is a map of, of where our IPSO hospitals come from, literally across the country. The size of the dot relates to the number of beds. And as you can see, and it was highlighted earlier, it's just as important that we take, we, we, we involve this, oh, I went, just as important that we involve the small dots, the small children's hospital as we do the big dots, because we should try to make, we need to make preventable death from sepsis a never event, right? Regardless of the size of the dot 
that that parent is bringing their child to. Um, this graphic, I, I love this graphic. This, uh, this is a graphic that we developed and, and sent, to, um, sent to our children's hospitals, really highlighting uh, four, uh, four elements of IPSO. And there's a lot, um, you know, we saw the, the today and at the end of eight, August, we saw the CDC core elements for sepsis, and it kind of gave me goosebumps because there's so much overlap between those elements and what, what we came up with uh, uh, 2015. Mobilize, right? Uh, uh, implement to reduce mortality, some of the, the key measures. Uh, uh, measure, not only measure and collect, but submit, right? Be accountable, be not accountable, be responsible, right, for the data. And review those monthly reports, not only individually, but as a collaborative, collaborate being the last, uh, the last column, the last grouping. In IPSO, we meet regularly with our, all of our hospitals. We have uh, 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 weekly office hours, we have monthly webinars to review data, uh, problems, progress problems. Uh, we have a web-based library, we have semi-annual workshops, we meet twice a year, we're meeting next week in Dallas, uh, direct coaching and a help desk. Uh, and this is just kind of a, a, a nine-year uh, uh, timeline of our collaborative journey starting in 2015. I'll highlight that in 2019, uh, we demonstrated a 28% reduction in 30-day uh, sepsis attributable mortality. And in 2022, uh, same for uh, uh, mortality due to septic shock. Why did it take so long? It took long because we had brought, kept bringing in new hospitals. There were five waves of hospitals altogether, uh, 62 hospitals. We started with 39. And as you bring new hospitals in, beginners, Right, they're sort of starting from scratch, so they kept diluting the data down. We didn't care. We just wanted to bring new sites in and, and improve. Uh, and this is uh, uh, just pictures of how we collaborate. Uh, and here are our outcomes. Uh, uh, I've already discussed uh, this. Um, in terms of uh, recognition, uh, there was a significant improvement in recognition of critical sepsis. Uh, which is on the right, and uh, suspected sepsis, what you'd call sepsis, over time, a very significant improvement. The incidence of sepsis went up too. Now you're going to say, why are we seeing more kids with sepsis? I don't think we were seeing more kids with sepsis. There wasn't a greater necessarily incidence of sepsis. I think we were missing fewer patients with sepsis. Same number of patients coming into our emergency rooms, it's just we became better at detecting it. Uh, and in terms of primary outcomes, I've already discussed this. Um, you'll see on the top left uh, a 35% decrease in mortality of suspected sepsis. You don't see the critical sepsis yet. These slides only go through 2020, but in 2022, again, a 20-some-odd percent decrease in mortality from critical sepsis or septic shock. But I think this is really the take home slide, right? This compares non-compliant with compliant. Remember, compliant is recognition fluid and antibiotics within that very narrow time frame. For critical sepsis, septic shock, right? Which of the two, I don't have a laser pointer, but uh, there's a 48% decrease in mortality if you were compliant, three-day mortality, 30-day mortality, compliant versus not compliant, these bundles work. They work. Suspected sepsis or, or, or sepsis in 80% reduction in mortality if you follow the bundle versus you don't follow the bundle. These elements work. Recognition, treatment. Secondary outcomes, we had decreased hospital days, decreased organ dysfunction, ventilator days, decreased vasoactive medication days, and ICU days once the bundle was followed. And this is just um, an illustration. We, we uh, uh, published many papers out of IPSO. This is just one looking at fluids, showing that patients who were hypotensive, patients, pediatric patients in septic shock, comparing those who got less than 30 cc's per kilo of fluid 
Remember, the adult bundles say 30, right? So we looked at those who got less than 30, those who got more than 30, and saw there was no difference in mortality as long as they got the fluid within the hour and that they got their antibiotics within an hour. And the take-home message there is you can't just rotely say patients need 30 or 40 or 60 cc's per kilo of fluid. You have to tailor it individually to that patient's needs, assess their responsiveness. And within IPSO, we have multiple tools to do that, ultrasound and inferior vena cava, distensibility, et cetera. I see you talk, Marty. Um, these are some of the publications that have come out of IPSO. Uh, uh, six are already published, five are in progress, and four are in the queue. Um, and again, these are a summary of our key learnings. Uh, bundle compliance and recognition are associated with lower mortality and pediatric sepsis. Uh, we've improved recognition in all four care settings, oncology, ICU, general floors, and the ED. And uh, implementing our bundle saves lives. In fact, by our math, we've saved 284 uh, children's lives in our hospitals and think that there are many, many more to come. Uh, and again, uh, just ending with, again, with the slide of the core elements, I, I think we hit it. Uh, I think we just hit it with, uh, with IPSO. So thank you. Pete, if you can stay up here, um, and uh, Dr. Prescott, um, Kedar, if you could come back up with us here for a minute. Um, little conversation here. Um, I just want to make one comment uh, relative to the work of, of the Michigan Consortium um, and Pete, your, your IPSO work here, and tie it into the CDC work. Uh, you mentioned being thrilled to see many of the things you talked about show up there, and I want to compliment the folks who worked on there, and Hallie, I know you were one of them, in actually having looked at and seen what was working. And it was not a green field, let's just start with, you know, experts in a room. It was actually to go out and assess what was out there and where success was being had. Um, I could ask all sorts of questions just to um, tweak the, the overall concepts. Your presentations were all outstanding. Um, but I, I want to I take the concept, of the two pieces of, of what were raised. Um, Pete, you mentioned making sure the small children's hospitals were involved. Hallie, you mentioned making sure that the hospitals up in the peninsula and other areas were involved. Um, and so I want to raise sort of off topic here a little bit. And Kadar, you lead a not-for-profit, which doesn't mean not without expenses. Um, how do we provide for the underserved areas of the country? Uh, we're having more and more healthcare deserts. Um, and even without it being a desert, there are places that don't have the resources that Northwell or NYP or University of Michigan or others bring to the table. Any one of you want to start with, how, how do we solve this paucity of expertise at, 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 at an, a very important level? We want people to come into any hospital anywhere and receive the kind of care that we just heard about here. Sure, yeah. I think I, I mentioned a little bit, we have a, somewhat of a unique funding structure, I think, with our initiative and the fact that Blue Cross pays our hospitals to participate so that they are it's not just sort of a mandate without resources, they get actually resources to facilitate the data collection and to facilitate the quality improvement. And so I think that's been unique in terms of being able to engage all of the hospitals. Um, and I mentioned sort of we do that um, twice a year survey of our hospitals and we always ask, you know, would you be able to do everything that you do without these resources and sort of how important it is. And we consistently hear back from our hospitals actually how important it is that they're sort of participation is sort of funded or subsidized. So then, um, and then on, on, the, on the Blue Cross side, you know, they do put a lot of resources in it, but by their estimates and by our estimates, it's overall a cost savings. So I think the question is just how do you sort of scale that, you know, to other hospitals, but um, ultimately I think there are ways to kind of make it all add up. So it's kind of a win-win for the hospitals and the people kind of funding the healthcare. Yep. So, what I just highlighted isn't expensive, Marty. You know, it's uh, 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 knowledge, right? It's uh, fluid antibiotics, recognition, et cetera. It's, it's knowledge. Um, we're not asking every small dot to have um, an ECMO program to treat patients with severe 
you know, refractory sepsis, et cetera. Um, in fact, Foster in the New York uh, uh, program, you actually define criteria for ICUs and, and patient referral pattern and all that. But I think that there's really, even in these deserts, even in those very small dots, there needs to be a, um, a, a basic minimum, right? There needs to be a floor of, of, of quality, of standard of quality that um, doesn't really require e expense. It's just a matter of knowledge. Well, the care doesn't require a significant expense, but all the process change. I mean, we, we engaged IHI at Northwell early on, and we got bills for that. Um, and, and again, I, I make a point. Not-for-profit doesn't mean not without expenses. There are we're people. Still, we're still charging you for it. <laughs> um, and we're probably still benefiting from it. You know, there, there was a lot of, of transformation of knowledge that was a key component of it. Um, you know, and you do have something like Michigan, where I presume Blue Cross is a dominant enough player that the state doing well has them do well. But a lot of places are fractionated. And I spend, I mean, hepatitis C treatment you had a lot of resistance because I'm going to pay for this now, but the patient's not going to experience the, or we're not, as a health care organization in the country, experience the financial benefit 20, 30 years. They're not my, they're, they're not my covered life anymore, putting that in terms. So, sir? Yeah, so, I mean, I think I have a couple answers to this question. One is that, first of all, I think if we treat, as I said earlier, each condition as if it was something separate from the whole, then we're going to try to tackle these problems individually and not as in a more systematic fashion. If you put in place an operating system for quality and safety, like I described, it doesn't just handle better care for individuals with sepsis. It handles better care, period, for anyone who presents to the hospital, emergency room, operating room, or otherwise. And so I think that investment, and that's a very real material investment, Marty, but it's not unique to a single condition, um, which I think is important, on top of which are learning collaboratives and such mechanisms which Pete, you just described and, and you described as well, this idea that you can bring people together in learning mechanisms, either sponsored by a payer or through uh, member dues. I, I don't know exactly how IPSO is funded, but those can be pretty cost efficient to try to create, as you mentioned in your presentation, those are pretty cost efficient to try to produce the impact that we're talking about here in terms of spreading reliably. IHI has done this across thousands of care settings. The, the patient safety uh, campaigns that we ran in the early 2000s reached 3,500 hospitals and health systems around the country, uh, and they were from everywhere. Um, big systems like Northwell, <laughs> tiny individual safety net hospitals in rural care settings. So it's possible to do this work um, and to scale systems-based solutions to improving patient care and, and patient safety. But I think we have to get away from thinking about this as a one, one by one activity and more towards systems that actually manage better care across, across conditions for all patients every time. Um, before I, I'm going to see if there are any questions in the audience and then move us back up, I am going to take this as an opportunity to lobby just out into the ether that one of the things that NSEPSIS, in working with uh, Senator Schumer's office last year, tried to do, and I know we're going to try to do again this year, is to get funding in the federal budget to actually put some dollars into helping underserved facilities have some of the resources, not for the care. Um, which is already provided for in, in, in the funding mechanism for care, but to undergo the process change to be able to create a system like Michigan has done, like you're advocating, like Northwell has done, the Children's Hospital system has done. And so part of, again, the advocacy component of this is to bring attention to it and have the employers come and, and be part of this, the payers come and be part of it, but also have some contribution from the legislative structure to help support some of this. Yes, sir, please. My question is, it sounds like there are a lot of wonderful things being done in many places, but I don't see the connectivity between these things. The CMS and CDC, we learned, became aware and now are working through a memorandum of understanding. How do we speed up the cross-organizational, cross-effort learning? Meetings like this are wonderful to become aware of everything that's going on, but there's probably a lot more going on. How do we increase connectivity and accelerate learning? Anybody? So, I mean, this is why I asked for a cast for healthcare. You know, so I think there's a, in commercial aviation, it's not, we don't leave these things to accident, right? We just, commercial aviation has clearly created a mechanism 
for proactively addressing safety considerations and concerns. And they did that because it's a business priority, right? Planes falling out of the sky is deeply threatening to everyone's business model, right? And I would argue that people dying of sepsis in hospitals should be deeply threatening to the business model of a hospital. Um, and unfortunately, it isn't as clear and obvious, when the, you know, relatively speaking, but it, the, the premise is still true, that when people die in hospitals, it undermines public trust and confidence in hospitals, as it is doing, by the way. If you look at data over time about trust in American hospitals, it has plummeted over the last 20 years. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we are not doing what we were called to do, which is save people's lives when they need to, and as well as listen to patients uh, when they come in with the concerns that, that, that April so eloquently described. So I think we need something like a commercial aviation safety team. We need a healthcare safety team that basically puts together the private sector, the, all of the delivery mechanisms and systems together with the public agencies that are represented here that are responsible for something like sepsis. And together, that recipe anchored by a clear, useful, um, codified data set, which is the underpinning of CAST, is uh, going to be what's going to drive large-scale improvement in the system. One more question, then I'm going to invite Orla back up here to bring us back to ground. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point. Um, we've talked a lot in this session about quality improvement, but I do think there's a huge need for more research in terms of diagnostics and also treatments for sepsis. Um, and in terms of, I think we need more clinical trials that take sort of new biomarkers that are coming out and figuring out how do you implement those into clinical practice with some kind of protocol um, and show that, yeah, the addition of sort of existing clinical judgment and existing tools plus this new thing used in this way leads to better patient-centered outcomes or, you know, reduction in, you know, costs or harms or other sort of important outcomes that we care about. So I think there's a huge need for work in that space, too. I mean, I mean Pete's, uh, you know, you described uh, IPSO's recognition bundle Add rec that recognition bundle, power that with, I think, power that with AI tools, and you've got actually a pretty strong formula for better recognition of sepsis today, at least better than we presently have. Um, and that, better than we presently have, would save tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, so it's not perfect. We will still miss, unfortunately, we will still miss some cases of sepsis, but we will do a heck of a lot better than we're doing today. So I want to thank the panel uh, for a wonderful presentation and discussion here today. Um, and ask Orla to come up and uh, bring us back. <laughs>